From New York, this is Democracy Now! If confirmed, I would be the first Native American to serve as Cabinet Secretary. This historic nature of my confirmation is not lost on me, but I will say it's not about me. Rather, I hope this nomination would be an inspiration for Americans moving forward together as one nation and creating opportunities for all of us. Interior Secretary nominee Deb Haaland testifies before the Senate in her bid to become the first Native American cabinet secretary in U.S. history. But she faced harsh questioning from senators over her past criticism of fossil fuel projects. We'll speak to Native American journalist Julian Brave Noisecat. Then we go to a refugee camp on the U.S. border in Matamoros, Mexico, where asylum seekers have had to brave freezing weather while living in tents. We'll also look at the Biden administration's reversal of Trump's Remain in Mexico policy. Recordamos muy bien cuando... We vividly remember when we arrived to the immigration office in Mexico. They didn't give us a place to sleep or anything to eat. Our children slept on the floor that night. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Top U.S. Capitol security officials blamed intelligence failures and each other for the deadly January 6th insurrection as they were questioned Tuesday by lawmakers. This is former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund. No entity, including the FBI, provided any new intelligence regarding January 6th. It should be also noted that the Secretary of Homeland Security did not issue an elevated or imminent alert in reference to the events at the United States Capitol on January 6th. We properly planned for a mass demonstration with possible violence. What we got was a military-style coordinated assault. Sund resigned after the January 6th attack, as did House Sergeant-at-Arms Paul Irving and Senate Sergeant-at-Arms Michael Stanger, who all said Tuesday they did not see a warning sent by the FBI the day before the attack, that was January 5th, that violent extremists were calling for war against Congress. The report quoted an online thread which read, quote, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their BLM and Pantifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent. Stop calling this a march or a rally or a protest. Go there ready for war. We get our president or we die, unquote. The Capitol Police issued its own intelligence report warning of a possible attack three days before January 6. Meanwhile, Robert Conti, the acting Washington, D.C. police chief, said the Pentagon was to blame for the slow deployment of the National Guard. There was not an immediate yes, uh, the National Guard is responding. Yes, the National Guard is on the way. The response was more uh, focused on, uh, in addition to the plan, uh, the optics, you know, the, how this looks uh, with boots on the ground uh, on, the, on the Capitol. And in, in my response to that uh, was simply, I was just stunned uh, that, you know, I have officers that were out there literally fighting for their lives. In other news from Washington, D.C., the Senate confirmed Linda Thomas Greenfield to be ambassador to the United Nations and Tom Vilsack as agriculture secretary Tuesday. Environmental and labor activists say they'll pressure Vilsack to enact better policies than in his previous tenure at the USDA. Food and Water Watch said, quote, this administration needs to drastically shift course by supporting sustainable, independent farming, halting the toxic expansion of polluting factory farms and ultimately prioritizing consumer health and worker safety, they said. Meanwhile, Interior Secretary nominee Deb Haaland faced harsh questioning from Republican senators Tuesday, who questioned her about her opposition to fracking, pipelines and fossil fuel development. This is Congressmember Haaland. There's no question that fossil energy does and will continue to play a major role in America for years to come. I know how important oil and gas revenues are to critical services, but we must also recognize that the energy industry is innovating and our climate challenge must be addressed. 
If confirmed, Deb Holland will be the first Native American to serve in a cabinet position. We'll have more on her hearing after headlines with Native American journalist Julian Brave Noisecat. In other cabinet news, Health and Human Services Secretary nominee Javier Becerra faced questions from Republicans over his support of reproductive rights. He responded to a question by Indiana Senator Mike Braun on whether he would use taxpayer money to fund abortion services. Well, we, we probably will not agree on all the issues. I can say to you that we will definitely follow the law when it comes to the use of federal resources. And so I, there I can make that commitment that we will follow the law. He was also questioned about his support over the Affordable Care Act. He's the former attorney general of California. The House will vote Friday to pass the $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package. The bill's inclusion of a $15 an hour minimum wage increase remains at risk in the Senate, as Democratic Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Arizona's Kirsten Sinema oppose the move. Manchin instead proposed an increase to just $11 an hour. Consumer advocacy group Public Citizen is calling on the United States to agree to a temporary waiver on intellectual property protections for coronavirus vaccines. The U.S. is blocking an international move to waive World Trade Organization rules, which require countries guarantee drug companies monopoly control and contributes to vaccine nationalism. As of last week, 130 countries had not yet received a single vaccine dose. In Lebanon, scandal has erupted, and the World Bank threatened to suspend financing for Lebanon's vaccination program after a group of lawmakers received shots inside the parliament building ahead of people who were registered on priority lists. Over 200 members of the rabbinical human rights organization Trua are calling on the Israeli government to distribute coronavirus vaccines to Palestinians, citing the moral and legal imperative to vaccinate all residents of the occupied territories. A warning to our audience. The next three headlines contain descriptions of violence. In New York, a grand jury has decided not to file charges against the Rochester police officers involved in the death of Daniel Prude. Prude died last March from asphyxiation after officers handcuffed him while he was naked, put a hood over his head, then pushed his face into the freezing cold ground for two minutes while he was kneeling. They were kneeling on his back. New York Attorney General Letitia James, whose office led the investigation, denounced the decision, saying her office had presented, quote, the most comprehensive case possible. In a statement, James said Tuesday, quote, Daniel Prude was in the throes of a mental health crisis, and what he needed was compassion, care, and help from trained professionals. Tragically, he received none of those things. In Georgia, the mother of Ahmaud Arbery, the 25-year-old black man who was chased down and shot to death while out for a jog, has filed a multi-million dollar civil lawsuit against the white men who killed her son. The lawsuit also accuses law enforcement officials and local prosecutors of attempting to cover up evidence during the investigation. The suit was filed on the first anniversary of Ahmad Arbery's killing, as people around the country marked his memory by going on a run and using the hashtag RunWithMaud. In California, a wrongful death lawsuit filed by the family of Angelo Quinto, a 30-year-old Navy veteran who died in December after police officers kneeled on his neck, has revealed gruesome details about his death. Quinto was reportedly suffering a mental health crisis when his family called 911 for help. Antioch police officers who arrived at the scene restrained Kinto by the legs and kneeled on the back of his neck for nearly five minutes while he was handcuffed. His mother said he pleaded, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. Kinto lost consciousness and was taken to the hospital, where he died three days later. The Antioch Police Department revealed few details of Kinto's death for weeks, but his family launched their own investigation. In India, a court has granted bail to 22-year-old climate activist Disha Ravi. 
She was arrested last weekend and accused of a sedition for sharing a document tweeted by Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg with information on how to support the ongoing farm workers' protest in India. The judge said the case against Ravi had, quote, scanty and sketchy evidence. In Niger, Mohamed Bazoum was declared the winner of the presidential election. The former interior minister beat out ex-president Mohamed Usman, who alleged fraud but did not provide any evidence. At least eight election officials were killed since polling day Sunday from explosive devices. Bazoum's presidency will mark the first-ever transfer of power between two democratically elected governments in Niger. In Malta. A man has pleaded guilty in the 2017 car bomb assassination of anti-corruption reporter Daphne Caruana Galizia and will receive a 15-year prison sentence. Vincent Muscat is one of three men charged with planning and executing her murder. Malta police arrested three other men this week suspected of supplying the bomb that killed Caruana Galizia. In Algeria, thousands took to the streets Monday, despite heavy police presence, to mark the second anniversary of mass demonstrations which led to the resignation of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika in 2019. We stopped protesting more than a year due to the coronavirus pandemic, but we have returned to resume the journey of February 22nd protests and continue until our goals are achieved, God willing. The students will not stop and will return to the streets. Long live Algeria. A group of Democratic senators has introduced legislation proposing sanctions for Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez and blocking financial aid and ammunition sales to Honduran law enforcement over human rights violations and corruption. Hernandez has been linked to drug trafficking in at least three major U.S. cases. He's a key U.S. ally. Immigrant justice advocates are denouncing the Biden administration's decision to reopen a Texas jail for unaccompanied migrant teenagers that was briefly used in 2019 under Trump. The first group of teens arrived to the tent facility on Monday. Officials say the camp is needed to avoid overcrowding in other facilities during the pandemic. The facility is located in the city of Carissa Springs. The camp has been widely condemned by immigrant rights advocates over its condition and lack of transparency in how it operates. Five out of state members of Texas's power grid operator ERCOT have resigned in the wake of last week's widespread power outages that plunge millions into darkness and freezing temperatures after deadly winter storms engulf the state. Meanwhile, Texas electricity company Gritty has been hit with a $1 billion class action lawsuit over price gouging during the storm. President Joe Biden says he plans to travel to Houston on Friday. And legendary beat generation poet, artist, and publisher Lawrence Ferlinghetti has died at the age of 101. Ferlinghetti co-created the country's first all-paperback bookstore in 1953, the iconic City Lights Books in San Francisco. His 1958 collection, A Coney Island of the Mind, remains one of the most popular poetry books in the United States. Democracy Now! spent the hour with Lawrence Ferlinghetti in 2007. He read an excerpt from his book, Poetry as Insurgent Art. Be subversive, constantly questioning reality and the status quo. Strive to change the world in such a way that there's no further need to be a dissident. Read between the lives and write between the lines. Be committed to something outside yourself. Be passionate about it. But don't destroy the world unless you have something better to replace it. To see our full interview with Lawrence Ferlinghetti, you can go to democracynow.org. Again, Lawrence Ferlinghetti has died at the age of 101. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. When we come back, we go to the confirmation hearing of Congress member Deb Holland, 
If she is confirmed to be Interior Secretary, she will be the first Native American cabinet member in U.S. history. Stay with us. Mother Earth by Walela. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show on Capitol Hill. President Biden's pick to head the Interior Department, New Mexico Congress member Deb Haaland, is returning today for a second day of those confirmation hearings before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. If confirmed, she would become the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary in U.S. history. At Tuesday's hearing, Republican senators grilled her about past comments opposing fracking, the Keystone XL oil pipeline and other fossil fuel projects. But she did have some Republican support. Republican Congressman Don Young of Alaska introduced Holland before the committee and urged Republican senators to back her confirmation. I'm the dean of the House. I'm the oldest member of both bodies. Uh, I have served with 10 presidents and 15 secretaries of interior. There's not much I don't and have not seen. I have a theory, because I'm a mariner, uh, that the captain of the ship has a right to choose who he has as his crew. I'm not always agreed with the secretaries of interior, but I will say that that's the responsibility of the president. President Biden has chosen Deb, and she is accepted, and I would suggest respectfully you'll find out that she will listen to you. She may not change. Like, she and I do not agree on carbon fuels. You know that. I, I, we've said this before. But it's my job to try to convince her that she's not all right, and her job to convince me I'm not all right. That's the important part about the secretary. Also, we keep in mind that another reason I'm supporting her, she is a, an American Indian. Uh, I am quite proud of that fact. Republican Congressman Don Young of Alaska introducing New Mexico Congresswoman Deb Holland, President Biden's pick, to head the Interior Department. Holland began her opening statement by speaking in Keras, her Pueblo language. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me here today. I wouldn't be here without the love and support of my child, Soma, my partner, Skip, who is with me this morning, sitting behind me, my mom, Mary Toya, who is watching from Isleta Pueblo, my extended family, and generations of ancestors who have sacrificed so much so I could be here today. I acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Nacotchtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway people. As many of you know, my story is unique. Although today I serve as a member of Congress and was the vice chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, if confirmed, I would be the first Native American to serve as cabinet secretary. This historic nature of my confirmation is not lost on me, but I will say it's not about me. 
Rather, I hope this nomination would be an inspiration for Americans moving forward together as one nation and creating opportunities for all of us. As the daughter of a Pueblo woman, I was taught to value hard work. My mother is a Navy veteran, was a civil servant at the Bureau of Indian Education for 25 years, and she raised four kids as a military wife. My dad, the grandson of immigrants, was a 30-year career Marine who served in Vietnam. He received the Silver Star and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. I spent summers in Mesita, our small village on Laguna Pueblo, the location of my grandparents' traditional home. It was there that I learned about my culture from my grandmother by watching her cook and by participating in traditional feast days and ceremonies. It was in the cornfields with my grandfather where I learned the importance of water and protecting our resources where I gained a deep respect for the earth. I'm not a stranger, stranger to the struggles many families across America face today. I've lived most of my adult life paycheck to paycheck. I've pieced together health care for me and my child as a single mom and at times relied on food stamps to put food on the table. It's because of these struggles that I fully understand the role Interior must play in the president's plan to build back better, to responsibly manage our natural resources, to protect them for future generations so that we can continue to work, live, hunt, fish, and pray among them. If confirmed, I will work my heart out for everyone, the families of fossil fuel workers who help build our country, ranchers and farmers who care deeply for their lands, communities with legacies of toxic pollution, people of color whose stories deserve to be heard, and those who want jobs of the future. I vow to lead the Interior Department ethically and with honor and integrity. I will listen to and work with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. I will support Interior's public servants and be a careful steward of taxpayer dollars. I will ensure that the Interior Department's decisions are based on science. I will honor the sovereignty of tribal nations and recognize their part in America's story. And I'll be a fierce advocate for our public lands. Interior Secretary nominee Deb Holland speaking at her confirmation hearing Tuesday. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia chairs the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee that is holding the hearing. He's reportedly not yet decided whether he'll back Deb Holland's confirmation. Manchin questioned her Tuesday. In your opening statement, you noted that fossil energy does and will continue to play a major role in America for years to come. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, do you believe that it's in our best interest to maintain our energy independence? And what role do you see fossil energy playing in that? Thank you, Senator uh, Chairman, for that question. And yes, of course, uh, we do. We absolutely need energy independence. And I believe President Biden agrees with that statement as well. I know that we want to move forward with some clean energy. We want to get to net zero. And as the chairwoman of the subcommittee on national parks, forests and public lands, uh, yes, 25 percent of our carbon comes from our public lands. So I think that um, as we move forward with the technology that you and I spoke about when we had our conversation, uh, we want to move forward with innovation and, and all of this for our energy needs. Um, so I think that's not going to happen overnight. And so we will absolutely rely on uh, the fossil energy that uh, you and the ranking member spoke about in your opening statements. Um, but at the same time, I think we can move forward with the technology and innovation as well. Yeah. Well, I think you, you pretty much know my position on that. Uh, I basically, I'm totally committed to innovation, not elimination. We're joined now by Julian Brave Noiskent. He's an indigenous journalist and vice president of policy and strategy at the think tank Data for Progress. His latest piece for Politico is Native Americans finally have a cabinet nominee. Will an adopted Tlingit take her down? Uh, Julian, thanks so much for coming back to Democracy Now! Can you give us your takeaways uh, from yesterday's hearing? Of course, Deb Holland will continue today in her confirmation hearing to make history, become the first Native American uh, cabinet member. Well, first, thanks so much for having me on again, Amy. It's always a pleasure. Um, so I have a few takeaways from, from yesterday's meeting. 
uh, yesterday's hearing, excuse me. Uh, the first would be that, you know, um, Republicans on the committee were trying really hard to get the sort of charged exchange that, you know, plays well to their base and their audience on Hannity and Tucker Carlson. And um, I don't think that they got that kind of an exchange. I actually had Fox News on in the background last night uh, while I was doing some writing. And there was not a peep about Holland's hearing. So I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, conservatives like Republican Steve Daines of Montana, um, you know, ranking member of the committee, John Barrasso of Wyoming, uh, all signaled that they were going to make this a fight and then, you know, took a number of swings at at uh, Secretary-designate Holland and, and missed. It was a big whiff for them. So I think that they're going to be fishing for, um, you know, some essentially some content for their viewers uh, in today's hearing. And I'm going to be keenly watching to see if they uh, end up landing any of those um, sort of punches. You know, the second thing that I would, I would point out is just that, um, you know, Congresswoman Holland, uh, I think was very thoughtful in her responses and incredibly measured. I heard her say uh, something to the effect of uh, after being grilled by by some of these Republican senators, you know, um, saying that I look forward to working with you and thank you for your questions and things like that. She must have said that um, nearly a dozen times in in the hearing. Um, but I think that she came with a presence that. Um, you know, made me very proud to be to be native. She, of course, introduced herself in her language. She acknowledged the territory of the people on whose land the hearing was taking place. Um, and when you juxtapose just her presence um, in that hearing with, you know, the history of Interior, a department that was once led by a man named Alexander Stewart, who described uh, the Interior Department's role in the United States policy as needing to be one of civilizing or exterminating Native people. That's actually the quote that he used. Um, you know, I think that it was a very, very powerful um, and important sort of moment for Indian country. You know, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, Native people tuned in from across the country to, to watch that hearing in the middle of the day. And then lastly, I would say that um, there were some moments where, uh, you know, I think that some of the exchanges actually really went went really well for for Congresswoman Holland and Secretary Designate Holland. Um, there's one in particular where Senator Steve Daines, who's been kind of the um, the leader of the charge against Holland, uh, asked her why she supported a uh, bill that would protect grizzly bears in perpetuity. To which uh, the Secretary Designate responded, um, "I believe I was caring for the bears." <laughs> Which uh, you know is just sort of a, a, a wonderful, very you know simple response. And immediately, you know, with all the folks following on on the internet, um, you know, people started tweeting about that. Uh, you know, people were using Deb for Interior, which was trending that day. Uh, and then people started using Bears for Deb, uh, hashtag Bears for Deb on on Twitter. Um, you know, just to like sort of play on this this kind of hilarious thing where you know voting for protections for grizzlies was supposed to be a big conservative gotcha. Um, and I think that in that, you know, there's just a way in which Native people are incredibly well practiced in the art of poking fun at our antagonists. We've, of course, had to do this for, for hundreds of years. Um, and I kind of liked how actually the tables kind of got turned back around on uh, Republicans in terms of the narrative. So I thought it was a, a good day, and I'll be watching very closely today. Well, Julian, I wanted to ask you, some of the, the critics of, of her nomination have, have pointed to her uh, one relative lack of, of experience and also uh, to, to her participation, her presence at Standing Rock and her support for the water protectors fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. But there was an op-ed piece by two former U.S. senators, uh, Mark Udall and Tom Udall, of, uh, former senators of, of Colorado, uh, uh, and, and uh, who and uh, who also said that uh, that Ryan Zinke, President Trump's nominee, only had one term in Congress when he was named to the uh, to the uh, Department of Interior, and there was no big. Uh, a, a raising of criticism about his lack of experience then. I'm wondering wh how you feel these things may affect her, the vote in the Senate. 
Yeah, I thought that the Udalls um, senators, former senators Tom and Mark, made a really good some really good points in that USA Today uh, op-ed. Of course, Zinke actually got 68 votes for his confirmation in the Senate, and I don't think anybody anticipates uh, Secretary Designate Holland getting anywhere near that number of votes, which I think is both a testament to the amount of polarization in our political system right now, but also I think to something that the Udalls identified, which is going under the surface here, which is that, um, you know, as soon as we get the first ever Native cabinet secretary, you know, nominated, um, conservatives act like, you know, uh, we're going to take away their land and their way of life and and things like that. And they, they literally, you know, have, have used things like way of life in some of their quotes, uh, criticizing Secretary-designate Holland. And, you know, listening to... Um, you know, a number of Western politicians talk about how, um, you know, how perhaps Native people are going to turn around and take away things from them, you know, strikes me as, as deeply ironic, perhaps even um, sort of a Freudian expression of the conservative id, uh, if you will. And, you know, of course, you know, none of that actually matches reality. As you mentioned, uh, yes, Secretary Designate Holland um, comes with more experiences than any prior uh, interior secretary, you know, the fact that she's a representative of the first peoples of this land, the fact that she went to the camps, um, you know, erected in the path of the Dakota Access Pipeline and cooked for the water protectors. Um, those are experiences that no other interior secretary has can say that they have on their resume. Uh, you know, she also has a very strong track record as a legislator. Uh, she rebuilt the New Mexico State Democratic Party in 2016, where they actually had a good year and what was an otherwise very bad year for Democrats. Um, and lastly, you know, I think what's really troubling to me about the way that conservatives are just coming at sec the secretary designate is if you look at her track record, actually, in Congress, uh, of all House freshmen, she introduced the most bills with bipartisan support in the 116th Congress. So on paper, she is one of the best um, legislators at reaching across the aisle. Yet, you know, Republicans in the media are trying to um, paint her as some sort of divisive partisan when she has never been that. I mean, listen to what Congressman Young had to say about her. I'd like to turn to Republican Senator John Barroso from Wyoming, questioning Congressmember Howland. As a general matter, um, should the federal government continue to permit oil and gas wells in this country? Uh, yes, and I believe that's happening. And as a general matter, should the federal government continue to permit coal mines in this country? Uh, yes, yeah, since um, ranking member, if I could just say, I know that coal mines were not a part of President Biden's executive order. As a, coal, as a general matter, should the federal government continue to permit copper, lithium, and other hard rock mines in this country? Senator, I believe that if we do these things in a responsible manner and protect the health and safety of workers, um, uh, I see us moving forward. Our, our, the earth is here to provide for us, and that's my belief. As a general matter, should the federal government continue to permit natural gas pipelines in this country? Senator, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, I believe this will go on for quite some time. And um, I know that President Biden is, um, he has put a pause on new leases, not existing ones. Uh, the, uh, the question was on pipelines. So as a general matter, should the federal government continue to permit oil pipelines in the country? Um, Senator, with respect to the Department of Interior, wherever um, pipelines uh, are, fall under the authority of the Department of Interior, of course. So that's the Interior Secretary nominee, Deb Haaland, responding to Senator John Barroso, who is a doctor, who also criticized Holland for once tweeting, Republicans don't believe in science. He asked her about her tweet, and she responded, if you're a doctor, I would assume that you believe in science, because he asked if she would still believe this. Um, Julian Brave Noisecat, if you could respond to what uh, Congressmember Holland is saying what her record is, and what you think needs to happen going forward. Well, firstly, I would just say that uh, ranking member Barrasso's history of comments, actually, on climate change is, is quite notable for 
a doctor who believes in science. As, as recently as 2014, uh, for example, he said that the science on climate change was not settled. Um, so I thought that that was an interesting line of questioning for someone whose uh, you know, statements of record are easily Googleable. Um, but nonetheless, that is the direction he, he chose to go. Um, you know, I think that, of course, uh, you know, the Interior Department, you know, throughout its history has, um, you know, essentially under the surface here, right, there is a real economic interest at stake. Um, if you looked up the campaign contributions uh, of, you know, to the, the Republican members of the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee, you know, you would find that, um, you know, among all of these, these, these uh, senators, uh, they're taking a lot of money from um, oil and gas interests, from mining interests, uh, you know, and if you total it all up, it'd, it'd be in the millions of dollars kind of a figure per year for, for all of them together. And, you know, of course, um, on the one hand, I think it's reasonable to ask about impacts to industries that are you know, significant in a state. But on another level, you know, I think it's reasonable to ask what the influence of all that money might be on the way that these uh, senators legislate. Um, and so, you know, I think coming into an institution, both the Senate and Interior, you know, which has for years um, essentially been uh, selling off permits to lease and, and drill for oil and gas on public lands for pennies on the dollar, you know, these are institutions that are very stuck um, in their ways that are very wedded to, um, you know, the fossil fuel in industry and economy as it has existed in this country, which has been... Um, through a large amount of subsidy and access to public land for many, many years. And, and you know, to come in and change that, you know, it's, it's um, obvious, I think, that, that Secretary-designate Holland is on the side of, of significant change. I mean, she did go to the camps in the path of the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock. Um, but, you know, I think she has to work with the elected officials and the institutions that, that she has um, which, you know, I mean, in this instance means getting through the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, uh, you know, getting 50 votes, at least for her confirmation, and then working with, you know, the permitting and leasing One processes, more. reviewing One them and reforming them as necessary. Uh, Julian, I wanted to ask you about uh, President Biden's proposed Civilian Climate Corps, which was raised several times uh, in the hearing uh, and your sense of uh, how Secretary Designate Holland would uh, would deal with that climate core and uh, and its impact possibly on her vote. So the the civilian climate core I think is a very interesting idea. It's actually one of the ideas that you can tie directly to the Green New Deal, and then of course echoes the New Deal before it. Um, in the New Deal, there was the the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a public works project. Uh, where we, we got unemployed people back to work, uh, you know, building uh, parks, uh, protecting and cleaning up parks, protecting the environment. And, you know, there is now a similar idea that has been percolating in environmental policymaking circles about, um, you know, getting young Americans back to work through a new program called what would be, which would be called the Civilian Climate Conservation Corps. Um, and, you know, I think that this is a very exciting idea. You know, I personally... Um, you know, if I was just coming out of high school or college, I might have looked at something like that and been interested in getting, uh, you know, some sort of job in it. And, um, you know, I think that obviously, you know, Interior has the parks under its um, purview and a lot of other, about a fifth actually of the nation's lands. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that program will ultimately run through, um, hopefully, Secretary, De Secretary Holland's, um, you know, executive authority. Finally, Julian, we just have 30 seconds, but clearly Senator Manchin is a kingmaker right now in the Senate, the conservative Democrat determining whether Neera Tandon gets approved for OMB, uh, questions about whether he'll support Deb Holland. He comes from West Virginia, big coal senator. Um, your thoughts on his significance and the significance of uh, the Republican Murkowski, this all rests on them. Yes, so um, Senator Murkowski is actually an adopted member of the Tlingit uh, and won a historic reelection through write-in with support of Native voters in 2010. So I think she knows that it would be unwise to, um, you know, offend Indian country here. So I think that there's a decent chance that she votes to confirm Holland. 
And I think similarly, you know, um, Manchin does not have that many native uh, voters in his in his state, but I think he understands the importance of this historic moment. And while I think he's going to ask some tough questions of Holland, um, I am hopeful that he will also uh, do the right thing here. Well, Julian Brave Noise Cat, we thank you so much for being with us, journalist and vice president of policy and strategy at the think tank Data for Progress. We'll link to your piece in Politico. Native Americans finally have a cabinet nominee. Will an adopted Tlingit take her down? Next, we go to a refugee camp on the U.S. Texas border in Matamoros, Mexico, where asylum seekers have had to brave freezing weather while living in tents. And we'll look at the Biden reversal of Trump's remain in Mexico policy. How is it working out? Stay with us. There's a place where I've been told Every street is paved with gold And it's just across the borderline And when it's time Take your turn. Here's a lesson that you must learn. You could lose more than you'll ever hope to find. When you reach the broken promised land. Across the Borderline by Gabby Moreno, featuring Jackson Brown. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we look now at how the Biden administration suspended one of the most controversial Trump policies, the so-called Remain in Mexico program, officially called the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP. Starting in January of 2019, the policy forced tens of thousands of asylum seekers who sought refuge in the United States to wait in dangerous conditions in crowded and squalid refugee camps along the border in Mexico, while their cases made their way through U.S. courts and often didn't. Biden has put a hold on adding any new asylum seekers to the program and says about 25,000 of the people who are currently enrolled in the program will be allowed into the United States while their cases are processed, if they meet certain criteria. This is asylum seeker Marlin speaking to the advocacy group People Without Borders, Pueblos Sin Fronteras, about facing homelessness in Mexico with her family after they asked the U.S. for protection. We vividly remember when we arrived to the immigration office in Mexico. They didn't give us a place to sleep or anything to eat. Our children slept on the floor that night. Well, on Friday, the first 25 asylum seekers in the MPP program crossed from Tijuana, Mexico, into San Diego, California. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas says about 300 asylum seekers per day could soon be processed. But problems have been reported with the government's new online portal, and the rollback of MPP has yet to start at another major border crossing in Brownsville, Texas. The Matamoros refugee camp on the other side of the border there is the largest one of its kind. It holds hundreds of men, women, and children seeking asylum, most of them fleeing extreme violence and poverty in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Some have been waiting since July 2019, when MPP was expelled expanded to the Texas border. Now they've endured freezing temperatures uh, during the winter storm last week. To learn more about the conditions in the camp, 
and when people will be allowed into the United States, we're joined by three guests on both sides of the border. In Edinburgh, Texas, Valor Gonzalez is with us, an investigative reporter covering the Rio Grande Valley for the Monitor, Valley Morning Star, and the Brownsville Herald. And joining us from the Matamoros refugee camp in Mexico, Dasan is with us, an asylum seeker from Honduras who fled his country in 2019 and arrived at Matamoros refugee camp last February. He's using his first name only in order to protect his safety and is a member of the board at Solidarity Engineering, which is working to improve conditions at the camp. Alongside Dasan is Chloe Rastatter, a field engineer for Solidarity Engineering. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Valerie, we were going to speak to you Monday, but you were in the camp. We couldn't reach you. Um, so you go back and forth between Matamoros and Texas. Talk about the conditions on the ground and what's happening with MPP. Are asylum seekers going to be allowed through? Valerie, were you able to hear? Uh, my question to you was, talk about the conditions on the ground in Matamoros, in these refugee camps, and how the MPP program is now moving forward with Biden reversing Trump's policy. Sure. I can talk about the conditions. I apologize for uh, problems uh, hearing the, the question. Um, so the conditions have shifted over the time as— MPP started, it, it started with people just sleeping uh, close to the bridge at, at the immigration office or outside of it. In the beginning, there was a couple of women who were pregnant and they were sleeping under a desk that was outside. Um, then they were sleeping under uh, uh, a roof uh, that was kind of open and you could see it as you were uh, going through the bridge. And then that shifted over into the plaza right before you cross the border there is a plaza and people were just kind of sleeping outdoors in tents and it was pretty uh, disorganized uh, then it became a little bit more formal when people started uh, just bringing more tents and and there was uh, a lot of uh, nonprofits and organizations who were helped on the US side and also on the Mexican side and that that slowly became a, a larger camp. And right by the plaza, on another side uh, of the fence, there is a fence that divides the plaza from a lateral park. Um, they, be, they they started pushing them that way, so the the public uh, could use it, the plaza again. Um, and so that area is what where they've been living at. Uh, those who have remained by the plaza, and there's been many who have left. At some point, the camp was in the thousands, uh, about 2,000, I believe. And now, as of the census that was taken about a week ago, there are 350 families, uh, about 750 people. And they were living in, and they are living in tents. And you could just see different kinds of materials that are strung together to try and protect them from the weather. It was particularly difficult last week when we had frigid temperatures. I was out there with them uh, overnight for one night, and it was uh, challenging to see how they kept warm and how they kind of got going again in the morning. Uh, the water was hard to use. If you wash your hands, it was it would it would feel like it was burning your hands because it was just so cold. And uh, but people uh, are are very resilient there. They have been. Um, adapting to all the different kinds of uh, challenges that they face. And aside from the weather, one of the most difficult um, challenges has been safety. Uh, there's uh, women uh, living alone with, um, sometimes they have children, sometimes on their own. And that's been, uh, that, that's presented a lot of um, challenges to try and keep themselves safe. At night, some of the women will try and find someone else to go with uh, because it's it's unsafe. There have been incidents that they were telling me about where men will enter their tents um, and, and and harm them or, or, or you know, just, uh, you know, I think they fear, they fear what, what might happen to their personal safety. Uh, thankfully, the woman that I spoke to um, had not... Uh, 
been assaulted in any way, but she had there had, had been an attempt. Uh, a man who tried to enter her tent, and she made, made a lot of noise. She called a neighbor, and she was able to find safety. But that is something that is a, a daily challenge. Uh, I'd like to bring in a. Cl uh, to the song, uh, if you could to talk to us, you're an asylum seeker from Honduras. Could you talk about how the Mexican government and the government officials uh, have been dealing with the asylum seekers as they wait in the camps? Well, my, uh, um, good morning. Uh, this is uh, been a very challenge for each one because the government over here. Um, really no have been the most help to us. Uh, uh, most of the time we have been approached for uh, have been uh, using a really a strong way to direct uh, our, ourselves. Um, our life was uh, really a feeling that we know was do a, getting the help we were needed for. And so many times the we was looking for the help for. Yeah. yeah, and to kind of echo what Dison says, we've got... I also just want to say we've that gotten... our guests in Matamoros in the camp are wearing masks, so everyone should listen carefully. And Chloe and Dasan, when each of you speak, if you could move toward more the middle of the screen, I think it'll be easier to hear you as you sit side by side. <laughs> Yeah, so as Dison was saying, we've gotten very little government support on the ground um, with this transition. We There was extreme cold in the camp this past week. The power outages highly affected both the implementation of the website and as well, and the communication between the organizations and asylum seekers. So there's been a lot of questions. People were supposed to start crossing on Monday um, from the camp. That hasn't happened. We're not sure when it's going to happen happen. The lawyers don't know when it's going to happen. Um, they say MPP is over, but there's a camp of a thousand people still here, and there's 65,000 people who have been affected by this humane policy. Uh, and in terms of the uh, many people who are no longer in the camps, who originally applied uh, and uh, for asylum, but perhaps are no longer uh, waiting in the camps. Is there any, there going to be any attempt to try to relocate them, either by groups, by uh, civil society groups, or by the government itself, as far as you can tell? Yeah, so there are efforts. It's quite complicated because people have been living in these conditions for two years. A lot of people have opted out to go home. A lot of people have crossed into the U.S., a lot of people have disappeared and nobody knows where they're going. On top of that, although MPP is over, Title 42 is still being enacted. So we're seeing effects of large migration, specifically in the Haitian population, but central from, um, but also with people from Central America as well. They're coming to our border. They're getting stuck at the border in really dangerous conditions. They are all. It's essentially stopping migration right at our border, causing a humanitarian crisis that can't be addressed by who we have on the ground now, because we have organizations who have been working with the people under MPP for two, two years. People have been living in absolutely terrible conditions in extremely dangerous locations that are hard to reach for aid organizations. And then you have a huge influx of deportees coming in, and you have a huge influx of new, migra new migrants who are trying to come and cross but are, are being denied what? because of Title 42. Chloe, just to understand, you said a huge number of deportees coming in. You mean people being deported from the United States, although yeah. the Biden administration says they're no longer doing that. Yes, exactly. We're seeing deportees. And actually, the deportations that we're seeing right now, at least at the Mexico border, is just creating a—it's perpetuating the cycle of violence at the border, because a lot of the deportees are actually people who came to— seek asylum and ended up being stuck at the border for so long in conditions that they could not stay longer at, cross into the U.S., and then get deported right back where they started. Um, and once someone gets deported, they lose a lot of rights and they lose access to services. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask Valerie Gonzalez, uh, you've been reporting on, the, uh, on both sides of the border. 
The could you talk about the the community opinion on the U.S. side of the border uh, about the continuing uh, problems in terms of uh, uh, asylum seekers seeking to come in? Because obviously there's been a lot of attention since the last election that there was a rise in 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 Trump voters uh, along the uh, the counties. Uh, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. I wonder if you could talk about public opinion on the U.S. side, even among, obviously, it's a largely Mexican-American uh, community on the U.S. side. Um, yes, that was something that I think caught a lot of people off guard, was the, the amount of support that the previous president had along the border. And it's, it's obviously still there. The reasons, though, are different than what um, many may have suspected. For example, immigration is is an issue that I think a lot of politicians believe that uh, Mexican-American voters are, are concerned with, and they are to some extent, but largely the people that were voting for uh, President Trump were people who were concerned about their jobs, who were concerned about the oil field. Uh, that's what they were telling um, the, um, the Republican chair in Star County, where they voted with the greatest um, margin in difference from the previous uh, presidential election to this one. Um, they didn't turn the county red, but they were very close. They also had significant gains in Hidalgo County, which is the most populous county along the Rio Grande Valley border. And people are concerned about um, their jobs. They're concerned about uh, just making sure that they have enough uh, money to, to be on to to bring food home and, and sustain their families. And immigration was was important, and the border wall was an issue that a lot of people along the border uh, are affected by, but are not equally concerned with. There are some people who are ardent, uh, ardently opposed to it, and there are some ranch owners who work with the government and cooperate, but the, the perception of of, of those on the other side, I think that that they'll sympathize a lot with the people who are stuck in Matamoros because we all know, we all know how difficult, how dangerous it is to cross into Mexico, um, and it's it's particularly more uh, unsafe if you are an immigrant, if you are suspected to be there and and are not from the community, then it's a whole lot more dangerous for you because you are preyed upon, but. I think we all understand along the border that it's different um, on the Mexican side. But initially, when MPP started, uh, I talked to the uh, the city manager for Bronzeville and asked him what he thought about what the effect might be to a city along the border. Because when we have asylum seekers who are uh, coming in, we have in ten floods, seconds or in large. When we have a lot of a, a number of people coming into the border, they will cross through border counties or border cities. And the city and the city uh, manager then said that it would at least give them some reprieve, some financial reprieve, which they have seen and are now re-experiencing again. Dasan, I want to give you the last word, and we only have another ten seconds. You've been there for two years. What gives you hope? Uh. I'm a Christian. I'm a real faithful Christian. I preach the gospel, the Jesus Christ, and I try to support the model of the everybody over here. And my friends tell me we can make it to the United States, and we pray a lot to the president can be changed. So really, we have well, a their goal made, and now we have a, the Joe Biden administration, and I believe it. He well, was I, the heat in the beginning of this game. We're going to have to leave it there, but we'll continue to cover this story. Of course, Deson, asylum seeker, and uh, as well as Valerie Gonzalez, I thank you both for being with us, and Chloe Rastetter. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe. <laughs>